I'm Annie from Boston, Massachusetts. And I'm Johanna from Vienna, Austria. We are the hosts of Fresh Hell, your international podcast that covers murder, mystery, and the macabre throughout history. Are you interested in the 3,569 ways your household could have killed you in the Victorian era? Do you know how malaria and syphilis played a role in the John List family murders? And have you ever wondered what Prince Albert's sex chair had to do with the murder of Stanford White? Okay, nothing. It had nothing to do with it. We're still telling you about it, though. It's a pretty great sex chair. If you're looking for another show that talks about Ted Bundy, this is probably not the podcast for you. But if you're looking for two women that cover lesser-known cases from all over the world with a lot of background information. So much background information that you will rock your local pub quiz from now on. Then find Fresh Hell Podcast on your favorite podcast app. We also have German cannibals. See you soon. Tschüss. This episode is proudly sponsored by Audible. Visit the link in the show notes for a free 30-day trial and audiobook today. Reach Freaks. Invisible Choir explores detailed depictions of violence and murder and is not appropriate for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. A small community in rural Georgia tragically loses one of their own. A son, a brother, a father, and a beloved uncle. But what first seemed an open and shut case of suicide quickly evolved as the primary witness to what happened eventually became the primary suspect in his murder, this time on Invisible Choir. I know he meant to intimidate him, but I really don't think he meant for the gun to go off like he did. I really don't. I had seen that gun one, one other time before that, and that's when he fired that shot at the out of the bedroom and stormed out of the bedroom and shot DJ. Yeah. It's not the place of a suspected killer to move a weapon and contaminate a crime scene. We were contacted by Amanda Shirley late last year with a special request to cover her brother DJ's case a case that the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, or GBI, considered relatively straightforward. Open and shut, if you will. But after conducting a preliminary review, I started seeing the all-too-familiar warning signs of the many missed opportunities. And then it hit me. We've been here before, examining the work of the GBI. And as we saw in the case of Kendrick Johnson's mysterious death last season, this one will also leave you wondering why and how. After speaking with Amanda and hearing firsthand her family struggle to secure justice for DJ, I'm reminded of my own family, of my own brother. Donald Ficky Jr., or DJ as he was known, was remarkably human, and his struggles and eventual death at age 27 are still greatly disputed to this day, nearly three and a half years later. This is the story of a boy who got lost somewhere along the path towards becoming a man, a person who, like most of us, made plenty of mistakes along the way, but ultimately, someone who was incredibly loved and admired by his family. This is DJ's story, and it begins in rural Georgia nearly 30 years ago. My name is Amanda Shirley. I am the sister of DJ Ficky, or as most may have heard, Justice for DJ online. DJ was the only boy out of three girls. Me and DJ were the two middle children. Growing up with DJ was a pain in the butt. <laughs> he was, you know, he was our my older sister and my little brother. So there was an eight year age difference between me and DJ. Um, so growing up, he was a pain in our butt. He constantly aggravating us, you know, wanting to follow us around everywhere, wanting to be right next to us when we had friends over, wanting to do everything his big sisters were doing. He wanted to be right in the middle of it. DJ Ficky was born on November 14, 1988, to Kathy and Donald Edward Ficky Sr. He was the only boy living among three sisters, but they were tight, and DJ followed them everywhere during his formative years. Like any boy surrounded by mostly women growing up, he spent the majority of his time learning from, laughing with, and at times annoying his beloved sisters. And of course, when you're... 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 years old, you don't want your little brother tagging around with you and your friends. So, But we got used to him. You know, he was my brother. We loved him. Being the only son, DJ quickly formed a special bond with his father and namesake, Donald Sr. He was my dad's pride and joy. They were, they had each other wrapped around their little fingers. DJ was full. He got away with a lot because he was my dad's, you know, little boy. But uh, DJ was a good kid. DJ was, he, he, he was going to church. My dad was, one of the last persons you would have ever expected to go to church. And after DJ was in church for so many years, he, he taught my dad into going to church. And um, my dad got diagnosed with cancer a few years into it. And DJ actually saved his life, or he saved his soul. I say he saved his life, he saved his soul. Um, 
because DJ was the one that got him in church, and my dad got baptized and reborn again. And that was the happiest day of my brother's, one of the happiest days of my brother's life. It was the happiest day for a lot of us. Kind of shocked us all, surprised us all. But we always say, you know, DJ got extra brownie points because he saved our dad's soul. So uh, <clears throat> now when it came time for my dad to pass away, my brother was 14, and it, it about killed DJ. You know, he lost his dad at the at a, at a young age when a child needs their father the most. His dad passed away, and it it really bothered DJ. Um, he started getting mixed in with the wrong crowd and started smoking marijuana and things like that. But DJ was still a good kid, you know. He was an average, typical teenager. But something changed in DJ after his father died. The close family, he seemed to grow a little more distant. He no longer had his hunting and fishing partner by his side. And at age 14, he was forced to grow up faster than most boys his age, who were still struggling through the most awkward phases of adolescence, typically with their fathers by their sides guiding them along the way. Well, he, he continued to go to church for a few years. Um, my mom kind of had her moment with God, and she was angry with God for taking her husband, you know, and I understand that. And I think he kind of, I think my, I know, I, I think my brother did too. And so they kind of got away from church and everything. And that's why I said that they got in with the wrong crowd, which I don't, can't really say he got in with the wrong crowd because he was, he was at, at that age where he was a typical teenager and teenagers experiment, you know, do things that they shouldn't do and make their mistakes and everything. So he was on his learning path, I guess I would call it. But he started using marijuana. He got his, you know, he got his driver's license. Um, he got his first job at the time. He worked at an amusement park here in the, in the local area. He loved that. He loved that job, operating rides. He started dating. I mean, he he was just like every other teenager. He had to have a good time on the weekends, you know, go out and hang out with his friends, have his friends over. We had we always had a swimming pool growing up, so we always had pool parties, you know, every weekend or throughout the summer. We would have pool parties and things like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he was a typical teenage boy, you know. Um, he, he missed his dad, but we all did. But we, we accepted that our dad was in a much better place and he wasn't here suffering and hurting anymore, you know, so. As DJ grew up and into a man, he would eventually meet and fall in love with his future wife, Brandy, and the two would eventually raise a family in rural Walker County, Georgia. Walker County, Georgia is a very country, rural area. There's not really much to do, and I mean, there's there's actually really nothing to do. <laughs> um, DJ met Brandy. They actually went to school together. Brandy was in um, a a couple of grades below DJ in school. They knew of one another, but I don't believe they were they were really close friends or anything. He met he met her at school. He knew of her. Like I said, it's a small town. Everybody knows everybody. After school was out, and everybody graduated, and everything. They came across each other's paths again through mutual friends on and off there for a few months and everything. And they started, they ended up dating on and off. While DJ was getting serious with Brandy, he was also fast becoming a favorite uncle to his two nephews and eventually his niece, Amanda's daughter. My little girl was DJ's world at the time. She had him wrapped around her finger. I mean, everywhere we went, I would put her in a buggy, I would turn around, and he would be gone with her, you know. <laughs> he wanted to go somewhere off to everybody, you know. He wanted to be the one that carried her around the store. And he, he just loved this little girl so much. And so he was a big part of my daughter's life. And he was he, he was the best uncle I could ever ask for for my daughter. She loved him, and he loved her. They didn't, and, he, and the reason that they got along so well is because he played with her so, so much. You know, he was here for every Christmas. He was here for every birthday. He was here for every Halloween. He was here for every, her first every day he was here for, and her second, and her third. And up until the day he got killed, he was here for everything. A few months after they had begun formally dating, the family discovered that Brandy was pregnant, and soon her and DJ welcomed their first child into the world. It was readily apparent that DJ was a natural father and took to the role in stride as he and Brandy planned their future together. Here comes this baby, and DJ's a daddy. So DJ and Brandy ended up moving in together, and then they, lived, they were living with my mom at the time. And this was in March of 2014. August of 2014, so the same year, the two months later, they decided to get married. It was a mutual you know, thing. They wanted to get married. They didn't want to just get married because of the baby. They wanted to get married. They loved each other. So uh, they just went to the courthouse and got married. And I have pictures of them after they got married. They were both just ear-to-ear -ear smiling. You know, they were, they were, it was the happiest day of their lives. 
Shortly after Brandy and DJ's firstborn child, Jack, celebrated his first birthday, the couple learned they were expecting again. This time, twin girls. My mom calls me and tells me about it. And, oh my gosh, I, they didn't even get home, and I'm on Facebook. We're having twins, you know, I'm so excited. I'm just over the ball excited. Because we didn't have twins in the family before. And so we were overjoyed. We were so excited about these twins coming. And uh, we found out that they were both girls. So then we started trying to think of a name for the other baby, because we already had Peyton picked out. And so they were racking their brains trying to figure out a name that would go with Peyton, you know, similar as, as far as a twin name. And I'm laying here in bed one night, and it just hit me, Paisley. Identical twins, Peyton and Paisley. Peyton after the NFL quarterback that DJ so admired, and Paisley at Amanda's suggestion, were born in June of 2015. And not long after, DJ and Brandy fell back on old ways. Brandy and DJ kind of fell back on their lifestyle that they were living before she got pregnant again. They started have some, having some drug issues before she got pregnant. And they kind of fell back on that routine after she had the babies. And when they started seeing that they had a problem and that they wasn't doing what they should be doing and, you know, things like that, they actually willingly gave custody of all three of the babies to the world. Kathy took custody of DJ and Brandy's three children after the two of them had eventually fully succumbed to their addiction to methamphetamines. The children were provided a safe and family-oriented home environment with their maternal grandmother. But as DJ and Brandy's struggles evolved, it came around less and less. DJ would often disappear for three or four nights in a row while using. Then he would always come back and spend time with his family and his young children. He was still the same jovial, funny DJ, but like many Americans, he was waging a losing battle with addiction and didn't want his siblings or children to see it up close. And then, out of the blue on October 3rd, 2016, the Ficky family's world would come crashing down as they knew it forever. Do you love reading as much as I do, but can't find the time to get to the bookstore or the local library? Check out Audible and use our special link today to get a 30-day trial with any audiobook absolutely free. Bring the library to your phone and the stories directly into your ears. I just recently finished Bad Blood, Secrets and Lies in a Silicon Valley Startup by two-time Pulitzer Prize winning author John Carreyrou. Bad Blood tells the fascinating story of Elizabeth Holmes, the 22-year-old founder of Theranos, a self-proclaimed innovative healthcare company that turned out to be everything but. Carreyrou's examination of the eventual demise of Theranos is an impeccably well-researched and riveting tale of corporate fraud, greed, and misdirection. Enjoy fascinating audiobooks while cooking, walking the dog, or investigating true crimes, each narrated by incredible voice actors. They take you inside the stories and reignite your imagination. Rediscover your love for reading today. Audible has literally thousands of titles available at your fingertips. So visit audibletrial.com slash invisible. That's audibletrial.com slash I-N-V-I-S-I-B-L-E. Or click the link in the show notes for your free trial and audiobook today. It's the call that none of us ever want to receive. Oh, God, I remember it just like it happened yesterday. I got a call from my mom, and I answered the phone, and she's hysterical. I'm hysterical. I could not hear anything she was saying. She was just hollering and screaming and crying, and she didn't even realize I was on the phone. I just kept saying, hello, hello, hello. I can't hear you. What's wrong? And the phone hung up. DJ's beloved older sister, Amanda, received a frantic phone call from her mother, Kathy, on Monday, October 3rd, 2016. Though her mother was unable to communicate at first, Amanda instinctively knew that something was terribly wrong. So, of course, I called right back immediately, and she's hysterical. I'm like, Mom, I can't understand you. Calm down. And she just shouted out, DJ's dead. Those two words would forever haunt the family of then 27-year-old Donald DJ Ficky Jr., who had been staying at an acquaintance's trailer with his wife just 45 minutes east near Chickamauga, Georgia. Initial reports indicated that DJ had killed himself. And I flipped on the light, and I screamed to my husband, DJ's dead. And I fell to the floor. And my husband got up and he said, what do you mean, DJ's dead? And I said, he's dead. And he asked, well, I think he asked what happened. And my mom's on the phone still. And she said, you've got to take me up there. And I said, mom, you don't need to go up there and see that. And she said, you've got to take me up there. I've got to get to my baby. Amanda, now befallen to immediate shock and grief, asked that her husband Rick drive her mother east towards Alabama to see DJ and to find out what had actually happened to her younger brother. Amanda then started the painful task of contacting DJ's other siblings and close family members to share the devastating news, starting first with her younger sister, Allison. I called and asked to speak to her, and she got on the phone, and I told her, I said, you need to get off work and come home to mom's. And she said, what's wrong? I said, you just need to come home. There's, there's been an accident. And she said, what's going on? I said, Allison, you just, you just need to come home. I said, it's, it's DJ. And she said, what happened? I said, he'd been shot. And this was before I even was told anything. I told her, he's been shot. I remember saying those words. 
And she said, what hospital is he at? And I didn't want to have to tell her over the phone that her brother was dead. And so I told her, I said, I don't think he's at a hospital, Allison. I said, you just need to come home. And she said, well, where is he at if he's not at the hospital? And I had to tell her, I said, he didn't make it out, and he's dead. DJ's mother, Kathy, had quiet suspicions of foul play from the very moment she was first contacted by the Walker County coroner that afternoon. She had actually been communicating with DJ via text message up until just three minutes before the first 911 call came in, just after 1.12 p.m. As he had done on numerous occasions before, DJ had been asking her for help and for a ride to safety and believed that he and his wife Brandy's lives were in jeopardy. After getting the terrible news and reflecting on their last conversation, Kathy knew almost immediately that her son had been murdered by a man we'll simply refer to as person of interest. As her and Amanda's husband made their way towards the Georgia state line to where DJ had been shot, she looked back through her phone at the last text messages that he had sent her, and they seemed to eerily predict that he was about to be killed. DJ first reached out to his mother at approximately 12.02 p.m. on October 3rd, the day of his death. <coughs> DJ, I'm back at old man's. <coughs> Kathy, don't be fighting with person of interest. Someone is going to get hurt. Who is Brandy with today, you or the person of interest? <coughs> DJ, today neither, lol. <coughs> Kathy, she's not worth fighting over. <coughs> DJ, yes she is. Kathy. No, she is not. Wake up and see that, son. Love you. Don't ever forget that. DJ. I love you too, Mom. Kathy. Be good. Help old man, and he will help you. DJ. You got to come get me now. Kathy. What is it, DJ? I'm sick. DJ. I'm going to end up dead here. DJ continues desperately texting his mother for about the next 45 minutes, revealing to her that he had been fighting with the person of interest again, and that he and his wife Brandy, whose relationship had consistently been on and off again over the last number of months, were both staying at someone's rural trailer in Georgia, someone who everyone simply referred to as Old Man. The person of interest regularly stayed at Old Man's trailer as well, though he slept in an RV camper park near an old shed on the property. Old Man and his wife lived in a rundown mobile home on the land near the main road, their trailer overlooking a small scenic pond surrounded by mature trees. The property, located just off Nickajack Road in Flintstone, Georgia, was a known trap house, or a place that people frequented to use methamphetamines and other drugs. There had also been police activity there as recently as that February in 2016, where the person of interest and three others were arrested for possession of meth and marijuana, including the property owner, whom everyone simply referred to as Old Man. Police also found scales, packaging materials, and other evidence suggesting that the property was also a methamphetamine distribution point, possibly part of a larger drug ring. DJ and Brandy both struggled with addiction, and over the months, one, the other, or both stayed at Old Man's trailer, and their on-again, off-again drug use often meant when one was trying to get clean, the other began using again. It was a perfect storm of substance abuse and intermittent conflict for the young couple, one that DJ's close family members began noticing, including DJ's older sister, Amanda. When him and Brandy got together, I started seeing a difference in DJ. DJ didn't come up. He still came around. He was still at all the family get-togethers and functions and everything, but... I could always tell when DJ would be using drugs because DJ would not come around me. I would go, I never went longer than a couple of weeks without seeing DJ. But when he was on drugs, I wouldn't see him for three or four days at a time. And I would always know he's using again, you know, or she's using again and he's trying to get her to quit and come back home or one of the, you know, a combination of both. You know, I, I don't know if it was both, but it was either DJ was using, Brady was using, and he was trying to get her to come back home or a combination of both. But, there was a big difference in the way he acted as far as he just was, I mean, he was still the perky, fun-loving, goofy, joking DJ, you know. It's just the behavior as far as him being around all the time wasn't there anymore. Because we would go three or four days without seeing him at a time. And then, of course, when he would come back home, it was the same old DJ, you know. Still goofy, silly, funny, never a dull moment, picking on the aggravating DJ. He was never depressed. He was never, you know, emotionally upset or anything like that. He was always DJ. Though information was still very limited, Amanda continued reaching out to close family and friends, calling for prayers and a miracle for her younger brother, DJ. And soon, it became clear that DJ had reached out to someone else for help just moments before he allegedly killed himself. At that time, I sent my cousin a message and told her, you need to pray for, pray for us as the DJ's been shot. And she was like, what do you mean DJ's been shot? He just sent me a message. I said, what are you talking about? He just sent you a message. She said, I was just talking to him an hour ago. And I said, well, what did the message say? And she sent me a screenshot of the message. And DJ had messaged her and said, I need you to do me a, do me a favor. And she said, I'm sorry, DJ, I can't. And he said, it will save my life. 
And she said, wow, what's going on? And he said, me and she's trying to kill one another. And she didn't read it right away. And two minutes later, he seen it again. Me and she's trying to kill each other. Well, she texts back, who's And he never got that message. He had already been shot. At 1.12 p.m., a frantic 911 call comes in to Walker County, Georgia's dispatch center. It had been just three and a half minutes since DJ Ficky had last texted his mother, Kathy, claiming that his life was in danger. Okay, what are you shooting yourself with? Uh, okay, is he breathing? Uh, it looks like it. I don't know. I just think How old is he? So I tried to get the gun. I tried to get the gun, and it went off. And he had his mouth. And I was like, man, you know. What, what, is it a 12-gauge? Uh, yeah. This is the first of three 911 calls from that afternoon. This first one was initiated by the person we referred to as the person of interest. He's clearly out of breath, trying to communicate to the dispatcher what had just occurred in Old Man's trailer off Nickajack Road. If you listen closely, you can hear the man claim that he, quote, tried to get the gun, and it went off. Is he still able to talk? Huh? Is he still able to talk? No. I mean, he's stuck in his mouth. All right. Is he still breathing? Yeah, that's up. All right. Hang on, hang on one second. I'm going to get everybody going. The man claims that, quote, we have a guy here who just shot himself never mentioning DJ by name, just explaining that the man put a 12-gauge shotgun in his mouth and that the caller tried to intervene when the gun went off. Toward the end of this first call, which only lasted 1 minute and 54 seconds, you can hear DJ Ficky's wife, Brandy, crying out in the background as she nears the caller's location. How old is he? How old is he? Suddenly, the caller hangs up as DJ's wife Brandy nears, and the line goes dead. It's the first in a series of subtle clues that the family believes indicates DJ's death was no suicide at all, but a murder. The dispatcher phones the person of interest back after the first call disconnects, continuing right where they had left off just moments ago. How old is he? How old is he? How old is he? 27. 27? Yeah. Okay, is he still breathing? Where's the damage done to his head? It's right in his mouth. 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 It's confirming that her husband had been shot with a 12-gauge shotgun in the mouth and that there was evidence of an exit wound on the back side of his head. The dispatcher updates responding police and EMS and also puts in a call to hold the local Life Force medevac helicopter in the event DJ Ficky is still alive. This call goes out at 1.15 p.m., just three minutes after the initial call for help came in. The caller again abruptly hangs up, but just seconds before, Brandy and the person of interest can be heard in the background crying out DJ's name as the last signs of life slowly exit his body. The male dispatcher continues coordinating the emergency response to the rural property, while another female dispatcher again attempts to reconnect to get more information about the chaotic scene unfolding there in Old Man's trailer. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. This, this is Walker County 911, okay? 911. Yes. Okay. Listen to me, okay? I will, please, I'll get off it. 
Okay. Who's the boss here? Stay. I need to talk to you. Can you give me your attention? Yes, ma'am. Okay. The gun, where is it located now? It's in the chair with him. Okay. I, I got the gun up and checked to see what it was. It was a 12 gauge. At this point, the person of interest, who's also the primary witness to DJ's alleged suicide, admits to touching the weapon after it had, quote, fallen next to him on the couch to see what it was. He reports to the 911 dispatcher that it's a sawed off 12 gauge shotgun. When she realizes that the caller has already touched the gun, she directs him to secure the weapon until police arrive so they can ensure a safe environment for responding paramedics. Okay, so you moved the gun, is that correct? Yes. Okay, can you secure that gun? Can you uh, get it unloaded safely and, and lay it to the side out of the way? Yes, ma'am. Okay, can you do that while I'm talking to you? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'll give you just a minute, okay? I have I told me to get the, the gun and secure it. No, don't, don't shoot it. Secure it. No, don't shoot it. I told it. Listen. The, are you going to be the one doing it? It looks like it's a single shot. It looks like it's a single shot. Okay, so there's nothing in the gun at this point, correct? No. The gun is empty, correct? No. 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 The first officer on scene briefly speaks with the person of interest, who presents him with a spent 12-gauge shotgun shell. The officer then heads inside the trailer to check on DJ. Inside, he finds the gun now placed high on a shelf above and behind DJ, and DJ's lifeless body still sitting on the plush leather love seat directly adjacent to the front door. He clears the weapon and places it outside the trailer on the front deck on a clear glass patio table next to the spent shell and a relatively full bottle of Clorox bleach. He then returns inside and checks DJ for signs of life, but there are none. He has suffered a grave close-range gunshot wound to the mouth from a number 427 pellet buckshot shell, a powerful heavy-duty round primarily used for deer hunting. After clearing the other rooms in the trailer for potential threats, the officer then radios dispatch, alerting them that the scene is now secure and clear for EMS to respond. Since 1.12 p.m., the gun has now been handled and moved three times, twice by the person of interest and one additional time by the first officer on scene. As paramedics arrive and begin assessing DJ's chance at survival, the officer alerts them to consider the trailer as a crime scene and not to disturb anything unless absolutely necessary. But after arriving, EMS quickly confirms what everyone else on the scene already knows, that 27-year-old Donald DJ Ficky Jr. is dead. Meanwhile, DJ's mother and Amanda's husband are still en route to the old man's trailer to see for themselves what happened and to answer the question, why? By the time Kathy and Rick arrive at Old Man's trailer, the coroner has already released DJ's body to the Georgia Bureau of Investigation's medical examiner for an autopsy. And as they make their way towards the trailer on scene, DJ's wife Brandy and the person of interest are standing outside, and there's only one detective remaining on site. He has just given the person of interest permission to begin, quote, cleaning things up. Given DJ's alarming text messages to Kathy, which were actually sent from the person of interest's cell phone, the same cell phone that was used to call 911 mere minutes after DJ had been shot, she requested that the detective collect gunshot residue samples from all of the people who were on the scene at the time of the shooting who at this point seems only to have been DJ, Brandy, and the person of interest. But as they all stand outside collecting their thoughts, other people begin showing up, one by one, to assist in the gruesome act of cleaning up old man's trailer after DJ's body had been removed. And though the first officer who had arrived on the scene attempted to contain the trailer as a potential crime scene, not a single detective who arrived afterward did so. They never cordoned off the area with crime scene tape, never marked, photographed, or collected any evidence besides the gun, and never searched the property in its entirety. The lead detective on the case, Detective Ellenberg, recounts speaking to the person of interest who claimed that DJ was suicidal and had expressed intentions of killing himself in the days leading up to that afternoon. And then, nothing. They noted the position of DJ's body, interviewing those present collectively together in front of the trailer, and then released DJ's body to the coroner for an autopsy. And then, they prepared to leave the scene. But it's what was not observed at Old Man's trailer that had the family most concerned early on, and ultimately confused as to why police had not treated his death as a potential homicide. <laughs> First, Old Man's trailer was absolutely filthy, a literal hoarder's nest of trash and random belongings strewn about, covering nearly every square inch of floor and counter space inside. But surprisingly, though the trailer was a known drug house, there wasn't a single shred of evidence that drug use had occurred in the home at all. No drugs, no paraphernalia, no scales or baggies, nothing. And though the primary person of interest claimed that he had been struggling hands-on with DJ, who he claims was attempting to kill himself when the gun just, quote, went off, appeared to have on a fresh, clean shirt. There was no blood spatter on him at all to speak of. Not on his clothing, not on his skin or hands, and not on the walls or ceiling behind or above DJ's body. Nothing. It almost appeared as if the scene had been deliberately cleared of drugs and cleaned of critical early blood evidence before 911 had ever been called. And as more information came to light in the coming days and weeks, as additional interviews were conducted, nearly every single witness's story would change. There were actually more people on scene at the time of the shooting, and the person of interest who stood closest to DJ at the time he was shot changed his story repeatedly. 
even eventually failing a polygraph examination when he was asked if he pointed a gun at and shot DJ. But the investigation into DJ Ficky's untimely death would come crashing prematurely to a halt when, just two days later on October 5, 2016, GBI medical examiner Natasha Grandi would certify his death as a suicide, the result of a self-inflicted intraoral shotgun wound to the mouth. And just like that, DJ's case stalled out, the medical examiner rendering her ruling with virtually no information from the scene other than that that was provided by the person of interest. And though the police initially categorized DJ's death as a likely suicide, they too would eventually change course, admitting that he likely died as the result of a homicide. But the medical examiner refused to reverse course on her manner of death ruling, effectively preventing the district attorney from sending the evidence on to a grand jury for review and eventual indictment. The bureaucratic machine that is the GBI effectively ground DJ Ficky's death investigation to a halt. But the family wasn't done seeking justice in DJ's case and seeking clarity and truth in all of the unanswered questions. So they hired a regionally renowned private investigator, and what he found out is absolutely shocking. Uh, my name is Eric Eccles. I'm a private investigator in Georgia and in Tennessee. I was approached uh, by Amanda Shirley, I want to say maybe three years ago, three, four years ago, um, in reference to the death of her brother. And she actually reached out to me um, through finding me on Facebook, and she sent me a message. Now, keep in mind, I get a lot of messages from a lot of people saying, hey, look into my story, look into my daughter, my son, or whatever. And, you know, a lot of times you either the time is not there or there's something that, um, you know, I, I've noticed that. I was like, well, you know, I don't want to get involved in this case. But um, Amanda, when she reached out to me, she, I think it was more than once, and she said, hey, I, I just, could you go check out this website I created? And could you look at some of the information that I put on there? So I went to the website, and she set up a Facebook with some stuff on there, and I started reading, and I was like, okay, okay, well, this doesn't make sense. Well, this doesn't make sense. So I, I reached out to her and said, you know, I'll, um, I'll meet with you. Bring me everything that you have, and, you know, I'll meet with you. She brought me the information. I met her and her mom. So um, fast forward, she wanted to tell me what happened in her own view and her own perspective. So I said, nope, I don't want to hear it. You know, I don't want to hear your opinion on anything. I don't want to get, you know, your perspective on anything. I want to look at everything myself and come to my own conclusion. And she, she respected me for that because a lot of times as an investigator, you start listening to people. Now you're looking at the evidence and their viewpoint, and that's not how I operate. So I, I said, let me, let me look at it, and then I'll get back with you. And I looked at it in a couple of days. You know, I said, you know what, I'll take your case um, because from what I've looked into and what you sent me, um, there's some – it doesn't appear that this was a suicide. Private investigator Eric Eccles took on DJ's case and started off on his own investigation into precisely what happened inside of Old Man's trailer on October 3rd, 2016. He submitted exhaustive public records requests, interviewed nearly every major witness himself, and even talked to the lead detective originally assigned to DJ's case. He quickly discovered the major disconnection between the Walker County Police's ongoing investigation and the Georgia Bureau of Investigation's abrupt dismissal of DJ's death as mere suicide. He immediately saw the red flags everywhere. Well, what, what the first thing that stuck out was the crime scene itself. The lack of pictures, the way the crime scene was handled, there was no separation of the witness. They didn't take him to the police station and interview him. Um, they immediately assumed and treated it as a suicide. And in my field, in prior cases, um, in prior investigations, I always believed you investigate the crime as if it was a homicide until it's proven not to be, and then you determine if it's a suicide. When you go into a case thinking it's a suicide, and anything you find or look at, you're going to think suicide. So, so you know, the things that I looked at, didn't make it just didn't make sense. I mean, you know, the 911 call, when I listened to that, you know, how, you know, she gave direction for them to tamper with the weapon and, and, and mess with the crime scene. So all of these things that I was listening to and seeing, it, it, it didn't add up. It just didn't add up. So, so start doing, you know, my own research on DJ, finding out, okay, yeah, he's been in trouble before. He's, he's uh, you know, he, he used drugs. He was in a bad situation, you know, but that doesn't negate the fact that he still should be treated fairly. So, so as I progressed and looked at the investigation, um, you know, I, I made a determination and said, you know, I'm looking at the police report and how the police report was handled as far as the detectives interviews, how he talked to m multiple people and they kept changing their stories. So I, I told Amanda, I said, you know, I want, I'm going to have to track these people down and I'm going to have to go talk to them myself. And that's what happened. I, I wanted to hear from the people who were there. And one, of course, was his wife. And then the other one was um, 
A uh, guy went by the name of Fat Boy. Eric Eccles interviewed both DJ's wife Brandy and the other man, an acquaintance who went by the nickname Fat Boy. Fat Boy admitted to being present in the trailer at the time the gunshot rang out. In the weeks and months after DJ was killed, Eccles interviewed them both while they were incarcerated on charges stemming from separate incidents. Both gave clear and vivid accounts of the person of interest entering the living room of the trailer in a rage, a sawed-off shotgun in hand, aggressively pointing it at DJ in a threatening manner while he sat unassuming on the leather couch. The final autopsy report corroborated their statements, as the final gunshot trajectory was described as occurring in a downward fashion from left to right, meaning the gun was held high above DJ's head and pointed down at him. When the buckshot pellets entered through the left side of his mouth, went through his brain, and came out the back side of his head underneath and behind his right ear. The trajectory was extremely unlikely the result of someone committing suicide, and instead followed the natural direction of someone standing and aiming the firearm down at someone in the sitting position. They did see what happened, and DJ did not bring the gun to the party. So in other words, DJ did not have the gun and have it in that downward angle, you know, putting it in his mouth himself. Someone else brought the gun to DJ to, DJ to to threaten him based on the witness account and to intimidate him and then the gun went off so so and then the other thing you know looking at you know the crime scene photos you know it said you know it was on the left side of his face and the downward angle and i'm like okay how's that even possible with a shot with a uh, saw with the, the length of the shotgun um and then you know he's right-handed and i'm like you know if someone's going to shoot themselves they're not going to put it in the downward angle why don't you just put it under your chin and blow your head over you know so i'm looking at all of these different things and scenarios and i'm like okay it just doesn't make sense so the account that I got from the witness, it made sense. Fatboy admitted to Eric Eccles and eventually to police that when he entered the living room in the trailer, the person of interest already had the shotgun in hand and that DJ, possibly in a defensive manner, had reached up and attempted to move the barrel when the gun went off, killing him almost immediately. He claimed that DJ and Brandy had been arguing that morning in Old Man's trailer and that the person of interest had grown tired of the couple's bickering and in a move to intimidate DJ, approached him with the gun. But there was something else that was eventually revealed, something that would have given the person of interest clear motive to kill DJ. He had been having an affair with Brandy for months, and as she would eventually claim, he wanted her all to himself. He, he was engaged. He was the guy was was having an affair with DJ's wife, and then the affair became known. So she was going back and forth between to, between the two, you know. So the, the guy, you know, he really lo fell in love with her, wanted to take care of DJ's kids. So it was just a big mess from the beginning. But I looked at that as motive, you know. Um, um, talking to, you know, Fat Boy, the witness, he said, you know, they always fought, they always argued. So I'm sure a lot of those fighting and arguing stem from the three-way relationship. Um, and, and they had been arguing that day, DJ and his wife, they had been arguing that day. And the person of interest pretty much got fed up and came out the room carrying the, the, the shotgun and held it to DJ's head. I mean, this is eyewitness account. And the, the, and then um, the wife apparently grabbed his arm, I guess, to try to, you know, pull, it, pull him away. The shotgun goes off. Now, per the witness, he said he didn't think that, that it was premeditated, that he tried to kill him. He just felt that he tried to intimidate him or scare him. But here's the thing with that. That's the difference between homicide and manslaughter. That's a homicide. It doesn't matter if it was intimidation or trying to scare somebody. When you bring a shotgun into the party and it goes off and you kill somebody, it's up to a jury to decide if it's, if, if it's murder premeditated or if it's uh, manslaughter by accident. So it doesn't matter. My job was to find out if DJ committed suicide, which he did not. Eccles recorded his interview with Fatboy from the county jail, and he confirmed early suspicions that DJ Ficky had not died by suicide. But Fatboy also provided some additional insight, revealing extra precautions taken by the person of interest before police arrived, and that he was potentially covering up critical evidence to throw police off his trail. What happened to the gun? Was there any wipe down? Was there any cleaning the gun? Anything like that happened? No, not, no. not that I'm aware of. It was just thrown on DJ's lap. Okay. It was just so the gun after the shot, he put the gun on DJ's lap. Yep, and then he went and washed his hands and called 911. Did he call anybody before he called 911? I don't think so. You don't think so? Okay. Did he change his clothes or anything? I think he did change his shirt. He changed his shirt? I, th I believe so, yeah. Okay, okay. You know why he changed his shirt? I think because it had blood and shit on it. Okay, okay. All right. So he changed his shirt because he had the blood. It did, might have. I'm not saying well, that. It might have, but you saw him change his shirt. I'm not even 100 on that, but I think he didn't change his shirt. I think he took his shirt off. Okay, he took his shirt off. I, okay. I believe. I'm not 100% on that, but I think. He, I'm, or maybe he put his shirt on after that. Okay. I'm trying to remember. I'm not 100%. I don't want to you know, say right. yes or no on it because I really don't know. Okay, in, in your opinion and what you saw when you were there, you can 100% say it wasn't a suicide. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely not suicide. Definitely not suicide. Okay. All right. Um, it was an accidental shooting. It was an accidental shooting. Yeah. Okay. 
Eric Eccles continued interviewing witnesses, and though the stories changed from their initial accounts given to police, over time, they all began to align. As minds cleared, as people sobered up, as they were separated and no longer fearing for their own safety, the truth apparently begins to seep out. That the person of interest likely threatened DJ with a sawed-off shotgun, Brandy possibly grabbing his arm in an attempt to stop him when the gun goes off, either inadvertently, accidentally, or intentionally. Police continued their investigation as well, conducting the very same interviews with witnesses. They too would eventually come to the same conclusion, that DJ's death at a minimum was the result of an accidental homicide. But the GBI was unwavering in their lacking consideration of reversing DJ's cause of death ruling. The GBI, I was, I was, you know, you, you always hear things about the GBI rushing, the GBI is understaffed, the GBI, if, if they can hang their hand on suicide, they'll go with that if, if, if there's no other option or whatever. So when, when the coroner arrived on scene for DJ, and the persons of interest were saying suicide, and because they had prior incidents, drug-related incidents at that house, everybody knew that house on Jack, Jack Road, they knew that house, they knew that environment. So when suicide came out, the coroner ran with it and said it's a suicide. So, so that led to the coroner, who was the senior person at the time, telling the, the police department when they got there, it's a suicide. So everybody treated it like it was a suicide. So now you go to the GBI, GBI now says, oh, it's a suicide, because everybody else is saying it's a suicide. But GBI didn't do a proper investigation. They, they took maybe eight photos. There was no photos of DJ's mouth. They, they, didn't, they didn't test the arm span of DJ's arms to see if, if he could hold the, the firearm in that angle based on the distance of, you know, how, how long his arms were. They didn't do anything. You know, so when I went and met with GBI, you know, I pointed all of this out. And I said, did you know that the police department changed their investigation from a suicide to a homicide? She said, no, I didn't know that. So this just tells me that, that, that the police department, the coroner, nobody called GBI and said, hey, this is not a suicide. We're still investigating this. They left it alone. No one called. No one talked to each other. So, so now I'm meeting with GBI. I'm, I'm giving her the interviews that I've done, the two witnesses who said that, uh, that the person of interest bought the shotgun. I gave her a recording that I recorded. The police officer said, nope, it was, a, it was a homicide. He took it to the DA. I did all of these things. I asked them, did they do a gunshot residue test? They said no. I said, well, wait a minute. A suicide, you guys didn't even see if DJ fired the damn gun? You didn't do a, shot, a gun or a residue on his hand? They said, no, and we weren't asked to do that. So I said, well, how did you come to the determination that it was a suicide? And they said, well, you know, you, we, we, we looked at, you know, we had the person who said it was a suicide. We, he, he was suicidal. Yeah, but you got all this from the person of interest. Eric Eccles would eventually persuade the GBI medical examiner to run a full toxicology panel on DJ's blood that was collected during his initial limited autopsy. The results took weeks to come back, but they eventually revealed that DJ had both THC from marijuana and methamphetamines in his system at the time of his death. When Eric Eccles finally discussed the results with Natasha Grandi, the GBI medical examiner, she refused to consider reversing her earlier decision on the cause of DJ's death. And the reasoning was downright mysterious and simply astounding. So I just wanted to let you know we got the toxicology report back on Mr. Ficky, mm -hmm. and it showed uh, stimulants that were present and not any depressants in mm -hmm. his drug, uh, mm -hmm. in his blood. And based on that, I am going to stick with the cause and manner of death that are listed in the autopsy report. And if you need a copy of the toxicology report, you can request that via open records, which I believe you've been in touch with to get copies of the autopsy report and other items as well. So to make sure I understand, the toxicology report came back and the drugs that were found doesn't indicate that it was a homicide. You're sticking with suicide? It, it shows a stimulant that's present, uh -huh. and based on that information, there's not anything that would appear to have rendered him unable to defend himself, and it appears that it is most consistent with a suicide still. Huh. Even after all the other evidence? Yes. Huh. <laughs> okay. And, and even, I mean, did, was there a um, a firearm residue test done on Mr. Ficky before he was cremated? Because I didn't see that in your report. It is not routinely performed unless it is requested. Let me check through the evidence and see if I don't recall doing one. Let's see. Evidence for firearms. Let me see what that has. I believe that's just projectiles. Just one minute, please. My system goes a little slow, mm -hmm. so I'm trying to open it. Firearms. Uh, yes, those are just the projectiles. So, no, I did not do a firearm uh, gunshot residue collection. It was not requested at the time, and that is not routinely performed. So, we really don't know that he had the shotgun in his hand and fired it if there was no residue. Tested. I, well, that gets into the validity of gunshot residue, which I 
believe you should probably speak to a firearms expert on. Which I am. Okay. Okay. All right. Um... Dr. Grandi advises Eric Eccles on the appropriate protocol for public records request so that he can obtain the full toxicology screen results. But he presses on during his phone call with her to get to the bottom of her reasoning that DJ ought to have been able to defend himself simply because a stimulant was present in his bloodstream at his time of death. Not in a physical or hand-to-hand -hand assault scenario, mind you, but while staring down the barrel of a sawed-off 12-gauge shotgun. What drug was found in there? What was the stimulant? Uh, he had methamphetamine. So he had meth? Yes. And that stimulant, having meth in the system, I'm just trying to make sure I understand, would, would not have prevented him from defending himself? It, it's a stimulant, so it would make it, he would be active. It, he would be active? Yes. Okay, so... And I'm just I'm just asking questions here. So if someone holds a shotgun to your head, he has a stimulant and he grabs the barrel, wouldn't that be active? Remember in this case it's an intraoral, so the barrel was inside of the mouth with the mouth closed. Okay. So he couldn't have been and I'm just asking he couldn't have been asleep or anything and the guy put the gun in his mouth. Well, and that's why we were checking to see if depressants were present in his system and they were not. And there was no depressants. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I was clear on what your what your findings were. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, ma'am. Dr. Grandi explains that according to her examination, the shotgun was actually inside of DJ's mouth at the time of discharge. But the crime scene photos that were provided to us for reviewing this case allude otherwise, and private investigator Eric Eccles agrees. I don't think the gun was fully into his mouth, because if the gun was fully in his mouth, then it would have been a lot more damage to his face and to the back of his head. The gas, the, the flashback, all of that... His mouth, his tongue, everything would have been black in his mouth. It would have exploded if, if the gun was fully in his mouth like that. I think the gun was close to his mouth. I think it was within a, a, a few inches. It's like if somebody held a gun to your head and you're sitting down, maybe three to four inches from his mouth. That's why half his mouth is, is shot off. That's what I think happened. The wounds to DJ's mouth and the back of his head were relatively superficial when considering the potentially explosive power behind a point-blank 12-gauge buckshot shell, especially if that weapon had a sawed-off barrel. The autopsy report detailed, quote, three-quarter inch lacerated shotgun pellet exit wounds. Multiple gray metal buckshot pellets were recovered from the brain. A white wadding with four petals was also recovered from the oral cavity. DJ's subsequent brain scan that was taken during the autopsy revealed, as far as we can tell, that three single buckshot pellets were stuck in his brain tissue. Assuming, as the report indicates, that there were only three clear and distinct pellet exit wounds in the back of DJ's head, there were still anywhere from 18 to 21 additional pellets left unaccounted for, likely embedded in the couch or in the walls and ceiling near DJ's body. But the police never actually investigated the area surrounding DJ. They never counted the pellet holes on the wall or in the couch because they trusted the person of interest account as he had given it, assigning him 100% credibility and integrity upon arrival. And then, as they cleared the scene and prepared to leave later that evening, they gave that same person of interest permission to burn the couch that DJ had been shot on that very day. So that vital piece of evidence, the potential key to a ballistics investigation that could have potentially revealed how far away the gun was from DJ's head when it was discharged, no longer exists. So when you look at the crime scene photos, there's one thing you don't see. That's, 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 that's blood splatter. You see blood on DJ, but DJ was, was bare chest, but there's no splatter. He was sitting on a leather sofa. Where's the splatter or where's the, where's the blood on the sofa? You shoot somebody with a shotgun, they're splattered. Okay, so where's that? Um, but then you go back to what you just said, there was bloody towels in the trash can, and there was bleach close by. Another heavily disputed interpretation of the crime scene inside of Old Man's trailer involves the bottle of bleach sitting somewhat out of place on the glass table outside on the front deck and what appears to be a bloodied paper towel sitting on the very top of a small garbage can inside of the trailer, just a few feet away from where DJ's body lay. The trailer was in total disrepair and unsanitary when police arrived. Dishes were stacked up from months of use with no one washing them. Garbage had been casually thrown on the floor, building up in large piles in every corner. None of it was bagged. It wasn't a place that people cared for and treated as their home. It was a place where they came to cook and use methamphetamines. Yet police never appropriately investigated the scene. And Eric Eccles has a theory on why that might be. So... Again, not not because, because the police didn't do a proper investigation to take pictures of him and Brandy and take him to the police station where you can see him on video and all these different things. You can't conclude if he took the shirt on or took it off or he took it off because he had blood splatter on or he put one on because he had blood splatter on his stomach. You don't know because they didn't do a proper investigation. They didn't separate the witnesses. They didn't take him down to the police station where you would have put him in an interview and they would have been video recorded. They didn't do those things. That's what makes it a shoddy, a shoddy investigation from the beginning. Then the only thing you have now is this guy's account of what happened, and he lied. So, so the fact that he lied only justified that he was guilty. That, that, that's the only thing I saw when I, when I, when I, when I looked at the, the reenactment, when I looked at it, and I said, okay, what he's saying doesn't even make sense. 
It doesn't make sense at all. The person of interest is standing up and he points the gun downward. Well, then guess what? That, 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 because DJ's sitting down, that gun now is in the downward angle. That gun goes off. DJ's still sitting in the couch. And that's when you look at his body, it's just like it just fell backwards. So that's, that's what you see. That's what actually happened. And nobody, nobody is looking at it that way and looking at the trajectory or looking at the rotation because of who DJ was. Who, do, who DJ was plays an important factor in the investigation in this case. They looked at DJ as a person who was a drug user, probably didn't have any family, prior arrest. He's over there in this house that we know is a, it's a, it's a meth haven, and someone died. Bam, okay, let's just write this one off. And that's what happened. In covering DJ's case, I have intentionally omitted the early evolution of witness statements because they changed so readily, so easily, and so frequently that it becomes virtually impossible to follow what they claimed actually happened inside of Old Man's trailer. After pouring through dozens of hours of interviews and police interrogations, one thing remains. The person of interest in this case is lying about what no one can say for certain until the GBI medical examiner reconsiders her cause of death ruling and the police and GBI reopen his case and test the only remaining piece of evidence still in police custody to this day, the sawed-off shotgun. It may hold the answers that DJ's family are so desperately needing for closure. That single piece of high-carbon heat-treated steel sitting somewhere in an evidence warehouse on a shelf might still one day crack the case wide open. The person of interest initially claimed on the 911 call that he was a possible hero in the making, seeing DJ holding a gun to his chin about to kill himself when he attempted to intervene. He then told police that he was in another room altogether when he heard the gunshot ring out. He was then caught lining up stories with other witnesses to ensure that the details all made sense, according to his recollection of events, and that he would be painted as the unfortunate soul who also had a hand on the gun when it accidentally went off. When police threatened collecting a gunshot residue sample from him, he caved, admitting that his hands were on the gun and that he would, of course, have gunshot residue on his hands. When they asked him point blank if he may have accidentally pulled the trigger, he concocted a story that DJ's wife Brandy had grabbed his arm, causing the gun to go off, then claiming to police that he was lying early on in their investigation to protect her from the truth, that she may have been the one inadvertently responsible for DJ's accidental death. He claimed that he cared for DJ as a close friend might, that he was trying to get him back on his feet. Yet, in the days and weeks before DJ was killed, he ambushed the 27-year-old on two separate occasions. Once, pulling a knife and holding it to DJ's throat after he exited the shower in Old Man's trailer. And again, when he allegedly pulled that same sawed-off shotgun on DJ and Brandy as they sat on a swing on the property, planning their future together. In that instance, he allegedly fired off a single round into the ground to scare both of them, then forcing Brandy to follow him into his camper. Never mind that none of these claims were ever appropriately investigated by police. That no one ever brought a metal detector out to Old Man's yard by the swing to verify Brandy's claims that the gun had been fired off in anger in the days leading up to DJ's death. Never mind that the person of interest was caught in several lies describing what happened. Never mind that he and DJ had gotten into a fight just a few days before DJ was killed, where the two viciously beat each other with a golf club and a baseball bat. Never mind that DJ ultimately won that fight, knocking out one of the man's teeth in the process. These two men were not friends by any shape of the imagination, as the person of interest claimed. That much is verifiably true. The person of interest in this case is a liar, and that is problematic for a variety of reasons. But if not for anything else, it's important because the disposition of this entire case, including the ruling in the manner and cause of DJ Ficky's death, is based entirely on this one man's perspective and his claims that DJ was suicidal and that he was simply trying to help and that DJ had finally ended his own life by his own hand. Never mind the GBI medical examiner's bold claim that the presence of a stimulant, in this case methamphetamines, should have afforded DJ every right to appropriately defend himself. Never mind that the person of interest claims that DJ was holding the gun underneath his chin in the moments before it went off. And never mind his claim that when Brandy allegedly bumped his arm, would have required the firearm to rotate aggressively over 90 degrees and be lifted into the air some two or three feet before it was accidentally discharged at the downward trajectory into DJ's face from his non-dominant left side. And never mind that there was no discernible blood spatter on the wall behind DJ or the ceiling above him and that police had permitted the couch's disposal, even though it represented perhaps one of the only remaining ballistics clues to the entire case. Never mind that a witness confirmed that the person of interest washed his hands and changed his shirt in the moments immediately after DJ was killed. And never mind the urgent texts and Facebook messages that DJ sent to his mother and cousin from the person of interest's cell phone requesting help, claiming that he would surely, quote, end up dead in old man's trailer if someone didn't come to get him. Never mind the fact that the gun had been moved at least three times in the minutes immediately following the shot, once at the direction of the 911 operator. And never mind that Brandy, who claimed on multiple occasions to witness the person of interest aggressively confront DJ with the shotgun, eventually, quote, shooting him in the face, was never actually questioned on scene. Never mind that though she was completely hysterical and in shock in the moments after the gun went off, that witnesses confirmed she was screaming aloud to the person of interest, why did you do it? Why did you shoot DJ? 
Never mind that despite DJ's sister Amanda and his mother Kathy's repeated pleas to police, they never collected and examined gunshot residue samples from the person of interest, and more importantly, from DJ himself. Never mind the fact that the Walker County Police now believe DJ in fact did die the result of a homicide. Never mind that after failing his polygraph examination, the person of interest in this case, as he had with nearly every single other lie that he had told in the weeks and months before, came up with a convenient excuse, a convenient truth, that he had in fact pointed a gun at DJ and shot at him. But it was a pellet gun from a few days before when the two alleged friends were casually, quote, hunting small game on old man's property near the pond. Never mind that DJ had been actively making plans for the future and had no demonstrable history of active suicide attempts or mental illness in the weeks and months before he was killed. Never mind that he had his son Jack's Christmas present all picked out, or that he had been planning which Halloween costume to wear at the family's party coming later that month. Never mind that none of the witnesses were separated and interviewed in the immediate aftermath of the shooting, and instead were left alone with the person of interest, a man they knew to possess a potential threat to their safety, a man they all feared. Never mind that the last 24 hours of DJ's life were filled with hope, and that he had finally convinced his wife Brandy to get back together with him and to leave old man's trailer and all of the drugs behind. And never mind that that very possibility of those two escaping alive could have enraged only one person to the point they took matters into their own hands, literally. You see, none of it matters at all in retrospect, because those first responders on scene, those police officers and those detectives had a decision to make in the first few moments they stepped foot on that property, a property that they knew to be a drug house. Instead of relying upon proven training and tested crime scene investigative methods, they instead trusted the one man they shouldn't have, the very man who was holding the gun at the moment it went off and killed DJ. I have always said that the only way this case is going to move forward or an arrest is going to be made or, or it's going to be pushed to the district attorney is that GBI has to change the manner of death because you cannot have an open homicide on the books. You cannot have something undetermined on the books when you have so much evidence pointing towards the person of interest. So until somebody changes that, nothing is going to be done because the DA is not going to do anything. Now, if the DA has an open investigation or open homicide case, then he has no choice but to close it. And the police have no choice but to close it, especially in an election year. But until that happens, nothing is going to get done. And then you have, you, I mean, Amanda, I mean, went to the governor's office, the attorney general, and everybody's saying the same old thing. Well, you know, that's a local matter. Oh, you got to have, they got to deal with it down there. Well, who do you go to when they don't do those things? You would think you go up the political chain of command, but nobody's getting involved in it. No one's getting involved. I don't know. At the end of the day, DJ was a human being. And it didn't matter if he spent time in jail, if he did use drugs or whatever. They should recognize that he had kids, that he loved them. And he wanted to have his family together. And that this case has enough evidence to go to the grand jury. And I and no doubt in my mind that the grand jury will come back with a true bill. And I think everybody should remember that. It, it, it's not about what type of, you know, what you are is who you are. Doesn't matter, you know, the things that, you know, DJ has done in the past. What matters is that he didn't deserve to die. And nobody didn't have the right to bring a shotgun into the party, even if he was trying to intimidate him or not. Doesn't matter. DJ needs to write justice that any other person afforded by law, and he's not getting it. And that's what people need to realize. Amanda, Kathy, and the rest of DJ's family continue struggling with all of the what ifs and unanswered questions left remaining in his case today. But until a change of course is instituted within the GBI medical examiner's office and with the district attorney, they're all left wondering, why, and what else, if anything, could they have done to save DJ's life? Even if my mom had left as soon as he sent that very first text message, she wouldn't have made it in time. And my mom has guilt. What mother wouldn't have guilt from that, you know? She lived with that guilt every day. Don't ever think it can't happen to you or your family. And don't be so judgmental because we have gotten that a lot. I mean, I know you, know you always hear you play stupid games, you win stupid prizes. And I know my brother had a drug problem. Majority of this country has a drug problem or an addiction problem in some way, shape, or form. It may not be drugs, it may not be alcohol, but something. They have an addiction to something. And my thing is, your lifestyle or your bad choices or your bad decisions should not justify if you were murdered or not. And... We have gotten that a lot. People want to turn the other cheek and look the other way and try to justify him being murdered because, oh, well, he, he was on drugs. You know, he used drugs. 
I don't care if they use drugs. I don't care if this woman over here was a prostitute and she got killed. I don't care if this person over here was a gambler. They mattered. They have loved ones. They have children. That's someone's mother. That's someone's father, son, brother, you know. And their murderers are still out there living their life like nothing ever happened. And it's not fair to the family. It's not fair to the rest of the community. Because if they did it once, they could do it again. And the next time, it could be your loved one that it happens to. So don't ignore it. Do something about it. Don't turn the other cheek. Hearing the little boy talking about wanting to go to heaven to see his daddy. And hearing him ask for, ask for his daddy. Wanting his daddy. No family should have to go through that. You know, especially children. Amanda Shirley and the rest of DJ's family could use your help. I've included links in the show notes to the family's GoFundMe and PayPal investigation expense fundraising accounts, to the Change.org petition requesting the GBI reopen DJ's case, and to their social media pages. Please, if you have a dollar or two to spare, consider donating. The family could really use your help as they continue bringing more attention to DJ's case. Go to www.justicefordj.com to learn more. September 14th, 2016. Hi, it's me. I'm trying to get hold of Mom. I called you instead so I can make sure you don't know who I called. Old man, my brain's back over here. But I don't know what's going to go on. She's back with me. I'm trying to get back with you. So, you got that information. If you need it, I love you. Bye. Thank <laughs> you. 